I am yours. I am yours. 
Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul. I am yours. I am forever yours. For all my days, Jesus, I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. For all my days, Jesus, I am yours. You know, can you all just step out? Let's, let's come close. Let's come close. That's the best thing about Wednesday nights. Is that there's enough room, enough space. There's something that happens in, in these moments, right?
want you to just do something right now. I want you to just kind of find somebody right around you. I really want you to greet them, look at them, and say, I'm glad you're here. And I really care. I really care about you. Oh, Anthony's ba- Anthony, you're here. He had surgery in your back. Hey, amen. Listen, tonight, well, <laughs> tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine of communion. And here's the reality about communion. The, the, the power of communion is relationship. The reason there's life in the blood is because the one that we celebrate as our Savior, the one who hung on the cross, who shed his blood, it's because he had relationship and created relationship for us through his blood with the Father. It's true. The reason he took the stripes on his back, and we're going to do talk about all that, but he took the stripes on his back because it, it, he had relationship with his Father, first of all, and to create relationship with us, he, he, he took stripes on his back to bear for us. So it was all about relationship. It was about him relating to us. His coming to earth, Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself of himself and took on, uh, became a servant like we all. Why? Because he wanted relationship with us. See, we can't, we can, he could not relate And we could not relate to him had he not done what he did the way he did it. It was all about relationship. That's the power of it. Okay, that same communion is the same kind of communion that was in the garden when it said that in the cool of the day that Adam and Eve would walk through the garden and they would commune with God. It was all about relationship. Communion is about relationship. It, you can't, there's no, there's no other way to, 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 to be able to walk in this life with the, at the level and at the impact level of what the word means without it. So it is about relationship. And as much as relationship can cause us issues, we were meant, created, formed by God to need each other. And, and just as in the elements, which we're going to talk about in a minute, just as in the elements, we receive and, 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 and take in by faith what they mean. There is communion that also produces healing in relationship. It's when we commune together, it's the same thing. It's the same principle, and it heals you. When it's holy, when it's true relationship, when it's based in God's love, it heals. We heal. We heal each other by the release of God's love through our lives. That's why strife is so bad. Because all the other evil, every other evil work starts happening out of strife. But as bad as that statement is, look, think about the, the opposite of that statement then then where there is true unity and communion exists, every blessing of God is made manifest and it's greater. It's greater than anything the devil can do in strife. God does more of the opposite in blessing. Where where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound, right? Amen. So, it's worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. I'm worth it. You, you get you get the picture. That's why I just want y'all to come down. I want y'all to get close and talk to each other for just a minute. It was it worth it? It's supplying which what each one has to supply. That's what Ephesians four says. God bless you. You can make your way back. Yeah. Thank you, Seth and.
Cindy. Oh, yeah, and I'm blowing you a kiss back there. You know, you talk about something uh, uh, heard but not seen. We <laughs> it is a blessing beyond anything we could have ever asked or thought when God sent us that drummer. Isn't it wonderful? Jeremy is such a blessing in this body. And uh, with the upgraded equipment. Oh, that wasn't Jeremy. <laughs> Kiki. Awesome. <laughs> Honey, you, you know, don't forgive me because you're phenomenal. Yeah, she... She plays uh, at different times, but it's really hard because you, you're really not a substitute. I couldn't tell the difference. I, I'm sorry, what? She stole a blessing. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, darling. We do appreciate it. Listen, that I can remember. Okay, so I'm, this shows how old I am. But I remember. <laughs> I can remember the day. He said, no, I remember when she was the first time that she, uh, on a New Year's Eve, when we, we do like a, a talent show on New Year's Eve. If you haven't been around us, you may not have been here yet on New Year's Eve. But uh, she, what was the song you did? Did you dance to? What, which one was it? Well, she was a little, I mean, she was a little girl, and she was all dressed up in her white, and I mean, she was dancing, and that girl got ready for that night, and honey, when she took the platform, she took it at that young age and um, has been continuing to do that as she is soon to be sweet 16. Amen. That's the fun thing about getting older. Now, there's a few. There's a few things that are good about it. <laughs> but it is good to be able to have those kind of memories. Yeah. Uh, if did did anybody? Oh no, these are new notes. Finally, yeah, we're we're on a new segment. You don't have these notes, so you will want those. And uh, if you've got a notebook to put them in, I really do recommend that you do because there's going to be more of this. We're so glad to have you back, Tony. And and you doing good? Doing good. You look great. It's awesome. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you a, a little experience that I had uh, just, well, it wasn't little to me, but uh, just in this past week. Um, we had the opportunity to uh, be a part of um, a training uh, in in. Port St. Lucie uh, on Sunday night. And so we left out of here Sunday and drove over to the coast and, and uh, at 6 o'clock met uh, to be a part of this training. And before I was going to um, minister the, the, the or the training was going to continue, uh, we stopped and had communion. We all stood around the table uh, there. There was probably about 10 of us. And um, and we we were going to start in this training that we were doing with communion. And so I'm standing there. <coughs> Let me say this first, that I um, have been dealing with a problem with my hip for several months. And believe in God and, you know, just all those things keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. But it's been a deal. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? We have we have some of those things that just keep, yeah. Well, I, I it, it wasn't going to stop me, but I'll tell you, it got to the point where I, it was hard for me to really move very much, uh, just to get up and do what I had to do. And then I would find myself being much more sedentary because it just hurt too much to walk. And so um, it's okay. I mean, I'm telling you that now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've always been open about these things that I'm believing God for. Um, but uh, this was this was a, a, a f another faith challenge. And so as we were starting to do the communion, I, you know, I was getting ready to do it. 
because, you know, we do that, right? We just, we take communion, and I love it, and I know it reminds me. And so it's always a joyful thing to do for me. Um, but I was really kind of doing it just kind of out of the way I, you know, I just, I was just doing it. And as I was about to do it, we bowed our heads, and I really felt faith rise up in me to believe that when I received this communion, that I would be healed. And I, I, I just came to agreement with the power of God in the communion that we were partaking of. And I will tell you that from that time to this, which was Sunday night, this is Wednesday night, um, I have not had any real pain at all. And I, it, it's a miracle because me and ibuprofen, we're, we're becoming acquainted. <laughs> and uh, I've taken no medication. I've taken, taken nothing. And, um, and it's, it for me, it's a big deal. I don't know about you, but I, <laughs> I have to believe God for everything, no matter what it is. And, and, and sometimes I get tired of that. Sometimes you want an easy way out, y if you know what I mean. Like, rather than have to believe with faith and all that kind of stuff, I just like to take the ibuprofen and let it get better. <laughs> but the thing was, I was taking ibuprofen, but it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. Okay. So I think there comes that point where I, I, I know for me, and I'm, I'm not against medication or any of those things, no condemnation about all of that. It's just for me, everything in my life, seems to come to this. Am I going to trust him or not? So something that may seem simple like that for me, it was a big moment to see God do an another miracle for me. He's done so many, but he did a miracle for me. Amen. So I'm telling you that, and, and it just so happens that our next class was on communion. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and... Um, I wanted to tell you that because I want to raise your level of expectation. I want you to, I think all what we've been doing on Wednesday nights is really talking about what it is to live in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit and to understand and be disciples, not clones, not conform to the image of man, conform to the image of God. We, we want to be people who are truly people of faith, not just people who talk about it or who have a membership in a church. We want to be people who live, breathe, eat, mean what we say and believe that the word of God is true. And, and as we have looked at these doctrines on Wednesday nights, the purpose of that is to establish us and understand that what we see God doing and what we hear are not just random statements being made. They're not just good sermons. That The word of God is alive and powerful, and it will perform that for which it was sent. And it's a two-edged sword, and it goes, and it really does divide between the soul and the spirit. It really does, and that's an awesome thing, uh, except it's a hard thing, because when it divides between the soul and the spirit, what soul shows up? What's not spirit will show up. This is not spirit. Oh, it's not okay for me to act like that. No, it's not okay for me to have that attitude. No, it's not spirit. Because the word of God will come and divide between what is spirit and what is soul. Amen. So we are looking at some very, what may seem to be elementary doctrinal issues. But the truth is we have to continually, just like me, I've been doing this a long time. And um, and I've taken more communions than I can count, and I've been involved. I've 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 been the one that's you know, overseen, uh, presided, if you want to call it that word, at many communions. But you know what? Reminding myself of the f in the freshness of what it is each time, that every time I do this, that the truth of it is still fresh in me. 
sometimes we lose that, right? So communion, or we call it the Lord's Supper. Um, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, which is communion or the Eucharist, as it may be called in some um, denominations, is the right of every believer. And, you know, every time you see something as your right, always understand you can interchange that with privilege. Every right is a privilege in God. It was instituted by Jesus for every believer to partake of the elements, which are the bread and the cup, in memory of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now, we're, getting, we're moving into that season here pretty soon where we're getting close to uh, Easter and that Easter season. And uh, I'm hoping this year that, that the resurrection life of Jesus Christ flows in our lives more than we have ever known and that we have a fresh encounter with what happened during this season. Now, we're going to look at the first uh, verse here, which is John 6, verse 48. He said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of this world. Now, he's, he's making it clear that th there's a lot more to the meaning of him being the bread of life. He, even though we may partake in a few minutes of a wafer or, or we've had bread that is symbolic, he's making it clear that there's going to come a time when you're going to memorialize what I'm saying to you, but you need to understand that I am the bread. Now, in some... Um, cultures and denominations there's a belief it's called transubstantiation in which uh, there's a belief that it actually turns into the body of Christ and it actually turns into the blood of Jesus um, I, um, I I don't have an argument with people over that I just don't think it's necessary it already it's symbolic we already have the power of that and we don't have to it doesn't have to turn into that it already has been that you know it, we're s we already have the blood of Jesus applied to us we don't have to have it you know magically change uh, we when we understand so just my my point of view on it don't anybody get weirded out on it the point is that Jesus is the living bread which tells us right away that this is not just bread it's not just talking about eating a cracker he's saying there's life in this the Jews therefore qu quarreled among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Okay. Now, when you read all of the accounts, you find out that this event, these statements that Jesus is making, causes quite a stir among the people. Not just those who are questioning him, but his own followers are now having a problem with what he's saying. And, I mean, I have to say, if I had been there, I don't know about you, but if I'd been there, I'd probably had a problem with it. Because it, when you don't discern these things spiritually, uh, it, it, it's, it's, very, it's a very strange statement. I mean, it sounds like he's really saying, you're going to eat my flesh and <laughs> I'm going to let my blood, you're going to drink my blood. I mean, it really sounds like that. It sounds like what he's saying. But again, Jesus is trying to help them understand, as he did always, using uh, symbolisms and, uh, and, and parables. He's trying to help them understand 
that that if you partake of the living bread, because this we you know God is spirit, He's not a spirit. You understand that? God is spirit. Okay. You okay? See, that's like saying people people say, well, God is. Uh, they want to they want to reduce uh, God to something they can understand or control. I don't know what it is, but it's like God doesn't just love us. He is love. God is spirit. And this kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. It, this kingdom that we live in, we're, we're to pray to bring what is in the spiritual realm to be made manifest on the earth. When Jesus was talking with them, he was talking to them in the spiritual realm as he was in everything that he was saying. And he was trying to help them to understand that you, your, your forefathers had manna. There was bread that came from heaven. There was already bread that came from heaven. It was manna. And you ate it and you died. But there is manna or bread now that has been sent from heaven Jesus is now the manna of heaven. You see, he's, say, he's comparing himself, and he's trying to help them understand. In the same way that your heavenly father gave your, your forefathers what they needed to survive and to get through the desert and all of that, how, how miraculously uh, manna appeared when they, they didn't have any way to get their own food. And so uh, God sent them uh, bread from heaven. He said, in that same way, God has sent you bread from heaven again. But now this is different. That manna that you ate, that you ingested into your body and ate, was only good for a lifetime till you died. The manna or the bread of hev from heaven that is me, that Jesus was saying, this bread, when you partake of it, you won't die. Here's the difference. So you've got to eat. In other words, you have to fellowship. And that's what he really says. You've got to fellowship in this body. You've got to believe. You've got to receive what, what everything that, that, this, that this represents, the heavenly bread that's been sent down, the living bread. There are living properties in this bread. So when you feast and when you fellowship and when you spend time, when you partake, of this bread, you'll never die. Now, that's pretty phenomenal. Say, well, people are dying. Oh, bodies are going by the wayside, but no longer. We don't, you know, believers never taste death. You understand that? We don't taste death. Oh, bodies may die, but we will never know it. We will never know what that feels. All we know is the transition that goes from this realm to the other realm. It is good news. It's an awesome thing. Now, that doesn't make it easy for the rest of us left here. You know, it's a hard thing because we miss that earthly body. We miss that person, and, and, and I understand that. But one thing I found out a long time ago, being at many what's called deathbeds and many hospital rooms and being there and the opportunity to be there and the privilege of being there when people step into heaven and all of those things uh, there's there's it's like something happens at some point where there's a transition and once people see what's on the other side they'll say see you later and i don't understand how that uh, you know I, i'm not going to be i'm going to try to um, this is not a doctrine, okay? So I'm not really trying to create a doctrine here. I'm just telling you this is my observance, and I've seen it. Those who, who y you will see, you can watch them, uh, if you if you get ever get that opportunity. It's it's such a holy thing. You see your friend, you see your husband, your wife, your whatever your relationship is. You actually see them become an eternal being. It's like. Don't leave me alone. It's really true. It's like they begin to move in a different realm. Why? Because that's really, we go, we, we live in an eternal state. We, we move into eternity. We never die. Isn't that awesome? 
So, we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because we understand there's a hope. And we grieve what we miss here on this earth. And everything changes and all those transitions happen. But Jesus is trying to say to us, understand that you are spiritual beings. Do you understand that? And you're going to live eternally when you partake of heaven's bread, living bread. When you partake of the sacrifice that's been made on Calvary. In other words, what Jesus has done for us, when we are born again, we step over, we already step over into eternity. You understand that? In a, in a uh, in life in eternity with him. So I'm already in my eternity. And so are you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've already stepped over into eternity with him. But you'll just change loca- lo- locations at some point. That's what the transition is all about. So he's really trying to say to them, I need you to get this, that I am the bread of heaven. I'm going to be, I'm not, you're not going to, you're not going to partake of me and die. You're going to find life. And he's saying to them, the blood, there's power in the blood. So you're going to partake of the flesh and you're going to partake of the blood. Amen. That's not some gross, weird thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 26, verse 26. Now, here they are at what's commonly called the Last Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Oh, now we get understanding. Now, you see, back up there in John chapter 6, they didn't have understanding yet. He was trying to help them understand. He was laying the foundation. They didn't get the understanding yet. But now, by the time we get to Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is now bringing understanding to what he was saying. Take, eat this bread. This is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that going to be awesome? I love it. Now, he's saying, okay, here you, here's the way it works. You're going to take and eat of this to remind yourself that my body, broken for you, has healing property in it because of the stripes that he took up on his back, and by these stripes we are already healed. We have been healed. So he's helping them. He's setting the stage for them. So when we receive communion, you understand it's not just another sacrament. That's why I did not put it in here as a sacrament of the church. It is a doctrine of the New Testament. Because when we receive this, uh, the, the bread and the wine or the grape juice that we have, when we receive it, we're literally coming into agreement with Everything that has been bought for us on Calvary, and in doing so, by, by approaching it with faith, we, it releases the healing virtue of Jesus Christ into our lives. It, it releases the power of the blood in our lives. Awesome thing. Uh, Mark 14, it kind of says the same thing, but it says, and as they were eating, Mark 14, 22, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. (coughs) Jesus did this at a time when he was preparing his disciples for what was about to occur. And, and the preparation of this was to strengthen them so they would, would have inner strength to stand up against what was going to happen through the crucifixion and so forth. When you read in Luke chapter 22, if you turn your page to pa- page uh, 96, says it this way, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took a, a, a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. So he's saying over and over and over and over again, You're going to have to remind yourselves of this. You're going to have to be reminded. In this life, you've got to remind yourself of the power that is available to you, what's been done for you, or the devil is going uh, to come and lie to you, and you're going to live a defeated life, and you're going to constantly be trying to figure it out. But I'm telling you this if you will, in remembrance of what I have done, remember this. Yes, you will find power in it. You will find healing in it and so forth. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> we know that in the book of Acts, this is, and, and we get to, um, and I'm not sure if I'm even going to go to Passover yet with you all. I think I may make that a whole separate thing so you'll understand even the power of what that meant. So maybe Cindy will try to do that next week. Um. <coughs> Jesus is with his disciples. He realizes that he is going to go to the cross. His disciples, he, he's realized, no matter what a ragtag bunch they were, they were his. And, and these are the ones that God was going to entrust the whole future to. And so they come, we know that after Jesus dies, he's resurrected. We know that he walks among them and with many convincing proofs, proves that every, all, everything he said is true. We know he's taken up into heaven and we get to Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. He's taken up into heaven. They go to the upper room and there they wait until they receive the Holy Spirit, the promise from the Father. Okay, so all of that's going on. But what I love about that story we're about to read is that after the Holy Spirit comes and they all speak in tongues and they receive the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, Peter gets up and preaches and thousands came into the kingdom that day. The, the birthing of what we would call the church happens in the power and fire of the Spirit. It's an awesome time. And now... It's what we would call revival. Now, revival has come. It was the first revival because you understand that Jesus walked this earth. John the Baptist walked this earth. There were many who had heard the, the gospel and the good news as Jesus preached among thousands, but they all fell away when things got rough. There was only 120 left out of the thousands who was following Jesus. So now... Now there's a need for a revival because the word's gone out. Good news has gone out, but people have, have become cold. They, they haven't taken it, held on to it. So when Peter gets up and starts preaching on the day of Pentecost, there is revival. People are born again. People come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ thousands at once. And now revival culture begins. So what do they do? Let me see. Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Revival culture. Now that this has occurred, they've come into the kingdom. It's a major move of the Spirit of God. Now the culture is going to be established out of that. And how do they establish the culture? They continue. They stay steadfast in the doctrines. They learn the basics. They learn the foundation. They, they establish their experience in truth. They live in the truth of the apostles' doctrine at that time because we didn't have the New Testament. You didn't have a Bible to read. You have the, those who had walked with Jesus were there teaching what Jesus taught. Now they're living in the doctrine of salvation and, and, and staying steadfast and faithful. So what is revival culture? Well, it's going to demand that there is a faithfulness. The, the <laughs> this culture demands faithfulness. But in the faithfulness or steadfastness of them, they are also in doctrine and fellowship. So they didn't just sit in meetings and just get preached at. 
they, they were living, breathing, eating the word. They were receiving the doctrine and then working it out in their lives, and they were fellowshipping with one another and fellowshipping with the apostles. It wasn't like, you know, you have those that are high and lifted up and they can never touch the peons of life. That's not the way it is. We're all a part of this body of Christ, and you give honor where honor is due, but you understand they... Look, the, the culture demanded because revival could not stay. They could not do what God had called them to do if they didn't learn what had happened to them. You know, they came into the kingdom in a, in a, a mighty flow of the Spirit of God, but they had to learn what that was all about, and so they had to stay steadfastly, uh, becoming disciples. They had to be in the doctrine. They had to learn. They had to be taught. All of that had to be done, but they didn't just teach them. They fellowshiped with them. And then there was the breaking of bread. Now, I understand that you may not call that communion or what we call traditionally the Lord's Supper. However, I believe it comes right out of that, that Jesus said, this is my body. This is the bread. They were becoming the body of Christ. You see, they didn't know about all that yet. And, and the body of Christ was partaking by the breaking of bread. They were, in other words, fellowshipping and communing together. That's why I said to you, it's not just about that. The communion isn't just about, it's not just here. It's about here as well. <clears throat> when you read what Paul said about communion, he said, because many of you are not taking or receiving communion or participating in communion uh, properly, there are many sick among you that even die. Because you do not discern the Lord's body. Are you getting the picture? Anytime you talk about the body of Christ, it, it's symbolic. <laughs> he is the head and we are the body. And, and when we talk about the body of Christ, we're not just talking about that, that, that wafer that we take. We're talking about the body of Christ. When we do not discern the body, when we don't understand, we're part of something that was precious he died for. Jesus didn't only die that you could be saved and go to heaven. Jesus died so that this body, this, this, the, his, his brothers and sisters, this creation God created, we children would come together in a body and represent the kingdom and our Father. It's really true. So uh, the responsibility we have of dealing with offense and all that stuff, you understand, it goes much bigger than it's, it's just, you know, easier if we don't get offended. Or it's, you know, it's just a bad thing if strife is here. It's not about that. It is that it, it, everything that we do should build the body of Christ. So if I'm against you, then I'm not living at all in the realm of the spirit. And it's an amazing thing that we, <laughs> we can function at all. But he said this, he said, you know, there'll come a day, you know, the whole body's going to work together, each, each joint supplying what the others need, and in that we're all going to give our own supply, and that someday that he would come back for a church that was without spot or wrinkle. He would come back for a bride. You know, what is all that? It means that we're going to work this out. Now, it may be only, you know, a millisecond of unity, and he'll come right then, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can sustain unity, but at some point we're all going to come into unity, into the unity of the faith. Amen. Glory to God. Amen? Because that's what the Bible says, not because that's what I say. <clears throat> um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 on page 96, and then we're going to receive communion. Um, first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, therefore, my beloved free from idolatry, I speak as to wise men judge for yourselves. What I say, the cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread, which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread getting the point. We can only be one because we all partake of one. 
Look at First Corinthians chapter eleven, the next cha- the next scripture. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me." In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, "This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup." You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, you might think that it should say you proclaim the Lord's life until he comes. But if there wasn't a death, there couldn't be a life. We have to remind ourselves that there had to be shedding of blood so that there could be a remission of sin. We could not be forgiven if there was not blood that was shed. And, and so we remind ourselves that he, through his love for us, for the Father and for us, that he shed his blood and that his body was broken for us, for me, for you. And in that, I can receive healing, salvation, So we're going to receive tonight. And you know how you just pull that little tab on the top and get the, the wafer out and then you pull it more and Can can you play something? I don't know, maybe. Just put some music on for a minute. Here's what I want us to do. I know that we're used to doing this with someone who stands up and says everything, and we all do it together and, and all of that, and I think that that is awesome. But I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm very early. We're just just 10 after 8 right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, And I want us to take a few minutes right now. And I want you to just get with God. You have to move away from the people you're around just so you can feel like you're, you know, it's between you and him. Whatever it is you need to do, I want you to, I think I've read enough about what this communion is all about. I don't have to give you uh, all the instructions. But I want you to take, how many of you need healing in your body tonight? Let me see. Well, that would be just about all of us. Okay. So I want you to approach taking the bread. I want you to approach taking the bread as something that is between you and him right now and a kind of a reignition, reignite yourself in the area of faith for healing in your body. I want you to believe God again and take him at his word, just like I did. And I realized I really, I've been moving along in faith, sort of. I didn't stop long enough to really accept and receive. But that's part of what this is about. As I partake, I want to receive healing into my body. I want you to do that. That's what the Bible teaches us, that you can be healed as you, by faith, receive of the sacrifice that was made. And when you take the grape juice, I want you to do that from a from a place of thanksgiving, thanking him for what he bought for us on Calvary. And then, as you, as you take it, I want you to receive by faith strength, deliverance, power, whatever it is that you need from God, that he's our all in all. There's nobody like him. Amen. So you can find your own way.